Good morning, church family. I was fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian home, and as a child, one of my favourite songs had these words. Tell me the stories of Jesus I love to hear, things I would ask him to tell me if he were here, scenes by the wayside, tales of the sea, stories of Jesus, tell them to me. It's very special to have these few moments this morning to think about one of the stories of Jesus, a real event that occurred at a real place and time in the life of our Lord. And so as we begin, let's pray together. Father God, please help us to listen to you, to learn from you, and to love you more. In Jesus' name, Amen. The word kingdom is found 155 times in the New Testament and 54 of those times are in the Gospel of Matthew, just over a third. Matthew's way of presenting the Gospel is as the good news of God's kingdom. When Jesus started his public ministry, Matthew records that he began with these words, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. In the fullness of time, heaven's king will fully rule over the earth once again. And at the end of his gospel, Matthew records Jesus as saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so through his gospel, Matthew gradually builds up for us a picture of Jesus the king and life in his kingdom. I have a friend who's an artist. She paints beautiful pictures of wildlife and during the last few weeks of lockdown, I've been privileged to see via WhatsApp some of her pictures taking shape. First a layer of colour appears, then another, then a little detail, and so on, until eventually the whole picture emerges. We can think of the story that we're looking at today, the feeding of the 4,000, as building up another layer in Matthew's gospel picture of Jesus as King. It's my hope and prayer that over the next few minutes, we'll have another layer added to our understanding and appreciation of Jesus as our King, that we'll get to know him better, that we'll learn more of what it means to live in his kingdom, and that we'll be encouraged and filled with joy as a result. So what does this story show us about the kingdom of heaven and the kingship of Jesus? As I read this passage, the immediate thing that strikes me is the abundance of everything. Lots of people, lots of disease, lots of need, lots of food. So we're going to focus on the idea of abundance in the kingdom. And first of all, we see that Jesus has abundant power. Verse 30 tells us, Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute and many others, and laid them at his feet. In a mastery of understatement, it simply says, and he healed them. Can you imagine the power needed to heal people who'd never been able to walk, who had missing limbs, who'd never seen or never spoken? These were not recoveries or cures, such as medicine might enable. They were not people beginning to feel better from a cold or shaking off some backache. It wasn't a, a case of being encouraged to feel stronger or exercise mind over matter. These healings were miracle after miracle. The forming and forging of new limbs, the reforming of eyes that had never worked so that they could see. This is extraordinary power. Only God has power to create, to transform physicality in this way. Only he can bring something from nothing, can effect this kind of transformation. This is the sixth time in his gospel that Matthew speaks of King Jesus healing the crowds. It wasn't a one-off, it was part of a pattern showing that Jesus was God's son, the king, and what his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, looks like. When God rules completely, when all things are in accordance with his will, when all rebellion against him is quashed, there is wholeness and perfection the eradication of all that is damaging and harmful, the mending of all that is broken. 
When his ultimate reign and complete rule is established, Revelation tells us that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. These miraculous healings were a foretaste of that day when the kingdom is complete. We know from Mark's Gospel that this event took place in the region of the Decapolis, the ten cities which were to the east of the River Jordan and which were largely populated by Gentiles, non-Jews. These people of different ethnicities could see that Jesus' power was from God. They praised the God of Israel. So as Matthew builds up his picture of King Jesus, he's adding another layer, showing us his abundant power Jesus' power is the mighty, creative power of God, abundant in magnitude. And it's also abundant in reach. It's for all people. The power of God is not confined just to the Jewish people through whom the Saviour of the world would come, but is for everyone, of every tribe and tongue and nation. King Jesus is for anyone of any background, ethnicity, race or nationality. His kingdom is open for the poor, the diseased, the inadequate, the needy, the unlovable and the undeserving. There are no conditions. The abundant power of God in King Jesus is for everyone. It is for anyone. And secondly, we see that King Jesus has abundant compassion. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on the way, Matthew records Jesus as saying. Jesus has already shown great compassion in healing so many people over three days, but now he looks beyond their obvious serious need of deafness or lameness to their immediate needs of hunger. They were not in danger of starvation. They weren't in danger of dying. That wasn't the point. The point was that Jesus was really concerned that they might collapse or faint from hunger on their way home. It would be unpleasant for them. It would be inconvenient, a worry, and he was keen to help. Here's another layer to our picture of King Jesus. Not only does he have immense power, but he also has immense compassion. He cares about the small things in our lives as well as the big things. He notices the little things. He knows that they matter to us. I wonder if we ever really grasp these two truths, God's power and his compassion. Psalm 62 puts it like this. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God, and with you, Lord, is unfailing love. I wonder which of these we find it harder to accept and trust in. God's power or God's love? Do you consider that your problems are too hard for God to deal with or too small for him to care about? The truth is that nothing is too hard for God and nothing is too small for God. Do you truly live conscious that Jesus is King which means that he is sovereign and rules with power, and that he is full of love, which means he has compassion on all that he has made, yourself included. God looks at your life and my life right now with power and compassion. Nothing is too big for him to resolve. Nothing is too small for him to care about. No wonder that Paul, who had such a strong grasp of the gospel, prayed that the Ephesians might have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, then immediately offering praise to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. King Jesus' abundant power and abundant compassion resulted, thirdly, in abundant provision. Jesus' comment about the needs of the people is made to his disciples, who respond by asking, 
Where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? It seems unlikely that they will have forgotten the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 described in the previous chapter, but perhaps they thought it was a one-off, not to be repeated. Maybe they didn't want to be presumptive. Whatever the explanation, it is clear that they knew themselves to be inadequate to the task. This too is part of kingdom life. We have to acknowledge our own inadequacy. The needs we see around us are huge. The problems in the world are enormous. We have very little to offer in the face of this ourselves. Why does Jesus bother to use the seven loaves? He doesn't need them. He could have fed the crowd from nothing. After all, he healed them from nothing. So why couldn't he feed them from nothing? The seven loaves being given back to Jesus act as a reminder that as we live under his kingship, we are always and only acting as stewards of what is his. Everything we have is from God. In his kingdom, he graciously encourages us to remember that and to give it back to him for use in his service. There's no blessing for us or for others in holding tightly on to what we have. God invites us to work with him in this world as his friends and agents, and he's willing to use and bless what we offer back to him. In doing this, in giving back for God's use the little that we have, we also can begin to develop the sort of compassion that Jesus showed and which should be characteristic of his followers. Giving back to him what we have for his service and the blessing of others helps us to grow in our discipleship, helps us to grow as his stewards, helps us to grow as his friends. And so the Bible repeatedly urges us to give what little we do have back to God and see him bless it. Realising how little we have is a good place to start. If we give back to God our little love, our little compassion, our little resource in terms of money or time or energy, our tiny grain of willingness, our small desire to serve him, our meagre resource, then God blesses it. What's the tiny thing that you can offer to God today, that he can bless and miraculously transform. He hands it back to us to share with others and in doing so works a miracle. God provides abundantly, not only for us, but in a multiplicity of blessing for others. In God's kingdom, the tiny offering turned into abundant provision. There are seven large basketfuls left over. Imagine great big hampers, abundant provision and plenty to spare. This is how the economy of the kingdom of heaven works. I wonder if you find it puzzling that the next thing we read is the Pharisees and Sadducees testing Jesus by asking him for a sign. They seem to be trying to trick him or catch him out or perhaps they were after unshakable proof of who he was. Jesus repeated to them what they'd already been told in chapter 12, that the only sign they would get would be that of Jonah, predicting his rising from death after three days. Why were the disciples, and why are we, so strongly warned against what they were doing? The abundant power of King Jesus, his abundant compassion, and his abundant provision are all evident for us to see in the way he lived his life on earth. The picture builds up through Matthew's gospel layer by layer and they are also evident in his death on the cross and his rising three days later. These events clearly demonstrate his power over sin and all that is evil and harmful, the depths of his compassion for our every need and his abundant provision of forgiveness and wholeness and new life. They clearly demonstrate who he was, God's son and earth's rightful king. There is already abundant evidence demonstrating the kingship of Jesus. We should look for nothing more because there is 
nothing more to find. Jesus came that we might have life in its fullness, abundant life. He is the king of the whole world. He has the power to meet our every need. His compassion seeks to provide for all that we need. If we seek something further, we will miss the very kingdom that is on offer. Seek first his kingdom, said Jesus in Matthew chapter 6, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well.